are seven different feminine archetypes, and they all have their own unique strengths and potential weaknesses, and are all magnetic and beautiful in their own way. So let's figure out which one you are and what that means for you. Hey guys, welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Jills, and I talk about things like feminine energy, self-improvement, and wellness for women. So if that's something you're into, you should absolutely hit that red subscribe button below and join this wonderful community. So there are seven different feminine archetypes. There's the maiden, the mother, the lover, the queen, the huntress, the sage, and the mystic. These archetypes were originally brought to life by Carl Jung, but they've kind of been adapted to fit our more modern life. Now, I think we all have at least a little bit of each archetype within us, but we usually tend to really resonate with like one or two or maybe three. We can also embrace different archetypes during different periods of our life as well. And while discussing the feminine archetypes and figuring out which one you are, it's definitely super fun, but this can also be a very powerful exercise. Understanding the different feminine archetypes is a super powerful way to tap into the different parts of yourself and learn how to embody a specific archetype or embody the strengths of that archetype when you need it or when you want it. So yes, although you may really resonate with one or maybe a few, we all have the ability to tap into all of these archetypes within us. So in today's video, I'm going to share the characteristics of each archetype. There are potential shadow sides because they all have their own potential weaknesses, some examples from women in pop culture and media, as well as how to embody this archetype more, you know, how to embrace some of that inner lover or inner huntress within us. But before I begin, I actually made a quiz that you can take to figure out your dominant feminine archetype so I will link it below definitely go take that quiz it probably only takes like five minutes that will again tell you your dominant feminine archetype although you can definitely embody more than just that one so either pause this video and go take that quiz now or just take the quiz at the end but either way I highly encourage you to watch the entirety of this video so you can understand all of the different archetypes, hear the examples that I give, and learn how to better embody each one. Also, a great book rec to learn more about this topic is a book called Goddesses in Every Woman. I, of course, will link it below. So let's finally get started. First is the maiden, and she is portrayed by the goddess Persephone. So the maiden is youthful, receptive. She can oftentimes be a little bit more girlish. That doesn't mean that she can't also be mature though, but she has more of that youthful, almost childlike curiosity and wonder. She's creative, usually more flexible and adaptable. She's empathetic and usually a little bit more sensitive as well. She also tends to be a little bit more innocent and sweet, or at least she gives off that vibe. And she might also give off that like take care of me kind of vibe. However, some maidens can be a little bit rebellious as well. Not all, but some. So although she has all these wonderful qualities, her potential weaknesses is that she may lack commitment. She might lack direction. She might be a bit codependent or a people pleaser. She might embrace some of that victim mentality or get taken advantage of, or be possibly a little bit too childish and kind of live in her own fantasy world. But usually there's some sort of event and it's likely some sort of struggle that the maiden has to go through in her life that kind of causes her to mature, kind of forces her to step into the more mature maiden. And if a maiden can grow past her potential shadow side and mature, she can be an incredibly powerful and capable woman. And through that rebirth process, she can become very intuitive, much more creative, and much more wise to the world around her. And she'll be able to actually see her capability and power because a lot of younger maidens, they tend to doubt themselves. My favorite example of a maiden is honestly Elle Woods from Legally Blonde. She displays this transformation so well. You know, she's youthful, fun, innocent, but in the beginning, almost a little bit like helpless or oblivious. And when she gets dumped, she first wallows in her pity. She kind of victimizes herself a little bit, but then she steps up. Her being dumped forces her to step up. She gets into Harvard and becomes a lawyer. What, like it's hard? And through that process, she is totally transformed. You know, she finds a better man. She becomes so much wiser, more intuitive, more confident, more capable, and she just becomes a very successful woman. Daphne from Bridgerton is another really great example of this maiden energy. She's youthful, innocent, sweet, but also, you know, a little bit naive, and she's very oblivious to her sexuality. You know, the Duke kind of has to 
guide her a little bit in this area and help her to bring it out because maidens are often very oblivious to their sexuality when they're young and they need a little bit of support to help tap into that side of themselves. But through Daphne's marriage and becoming a mother, you can see she's really grown up a lot in season two. She's wiser, she's way more intuitive, she's capable, and she has this amazing soft leadership qualities. And she was one of the only people to originally notice the whole chemistry and spark between Kate and Anthony. A bit of a different example though, a maiden who's a bit more rebellious is Serena Vanderwoodson from Gossip Girl. You know, she's magnetic, playful, fun. She's carefree. And she has some of that rebellion in her, but she also kind of seems very innocent at the same time. Some other examples of maidens are Carrie Bradshaw from Sex and the City and Emily from Emily in Paris. We all wanted to be Serena Vanderwoodson. Now, if you want to embody more of this maiden energy, bring out that childlike curiosity and wonder. Let yourself relax, soften your body. Let yourself be more receptive. Let yourself be taken care of. Let yourself be more flexible. You know, you don't have to control everything. Bring out that inner wonder and innocence and playfulness and see every day as a new little adventure. You know, don't take things too seriously. Let yourself live a little bit and let yourself empathize with others and feel your emotions fully. That is how you tap into your inner maiden. Now let's move on to the mother and she is portrayed by the goddess Demeter. So as you might expect, the mother has a very natural, strong maternal instinct. She's nurturing, she's comforting, she loves to feel needed, she loves to help others, she's truly very fulfilled filled by that. And many of these women, probably not all, but most of them usually have a strong desire to have kids and become a mother themselves. And that is a very important part in their life. So you might really enjoy cooking for other people, nourishing other people, or just being there emotionally for other people. And these women likely feel like they're the mom of the friend group. You know, they're the ones always checking in on everyone. You know, if one of your friends drank too much and they're throwing up in the bathroom, the mother is the one who's holding that girl's hair back. The mother is really grounded. You know, she has this strong earthy energy. She's usually very approachable, much more down to earth, and naturally just has that comforting energy. You know, she just makes people feel good and feel safe. And these are the women who oftentimes are very gentle and soft, but they can be fierce and protective when they need to. Some examples of the mother in media are Glinda the Good Witch from Wizard of Oz. I'm Glinda, the Witch of the North. You know, she's beautiful, nurturing, has this soft, comforting presence. Also the mom from Forrest Gump, you know, she's willing to do what it takes to protect her kid and take care of her kid and she has this soft grounding energy. Monica from Friends, she's another example. She's more of the mom of the friend group. Also people like Jennifer Garner, Reese Witherspoon, even Angelina Jolie, they all give off strong mother energy. Now the shadow side of the mother is that she loves to nurture, she loves to feel needed, right? So sometimes she can lack boundaries and she can give and give and give to others and leave none for herself. She can get burnt out. She can struggle to say no. So although giving to others and helping others can be an incredibly fulfilling thing for the mother archetype, it can also be draining if they have no time for themselves or if they're not being nurtured too, you know, if they're not being taken care of as well. Another potential shadow side of the mother is that she can sometimes suppress her feelings, her emotions, her needs, and kind of bury it down because, you know, she's usually more focused on other people than herself. So if a woman who really embodies this archetype is upset or sad, or struggling or angry. Instead of talking about it and expressing her feelings, sometimes she will bury it down and then become a bit passive aggressive about it or resentful about it later. And lastly, they might have that mother's know best type of personality where they know the right answer to everything. They know how to do things the best. They know what other people need and they can sometimes be a little bit controlling. And so they can unknowingly give off the message to either their kids or other people in their life that they aren't capable or what they're doing isn't good enough because she has this tendency to sometimes take over. You know, she's trying to help, but sometimes you have to let people do things on their own, even if you think that you could do it better. And this can help prevent you from getting burnt out too. Now, if you want to embody more of that mother archetype, nurture comfort others, be more approachable, be welcoming, cook a delicious meal for your friends and family. Let that love you feel toward others, let it radiate from you. Let other people in your life truly feel it and take care of the people and things you love. And this does not just have to be kids. This could be your friends, your pets, your plants, 
your house, your community, even yourself. Many women will naturally embody this archetype when they become mothers. And when they have, you know, a newborn baby, especially when they're fresh out of the womb, you know, they're very dependent on you and your life kind of revolves around them for a little bit. And you really have to step into that mother role. So I'm not saying to have a kid to turn on that mother archetype within you. But what I am saying is that usually having children will naturally bring out the mother archetype in every woman. Next is the lover and she is embodied by the goddess Aphrodite. The lover is sensual, slow. She's present in everything she does. She's magnetic and she kind of radiates sex appeal even when she's not trying to. And she's usually much more in tune with her sexuality as well than other women. She's passionate, usually very creative. She's extroverted, she's expressive, possibly a little bit dramatic. And she loves love, she's moved by love. How is she going to have any time for being in love? And she can fall in love pretty quickly and pretty easily, but with that same regard, she can also fall out of love pretty quickly and easily. The lover's main priority is feeling her way through life and experiencing everything to the fullest. You know, she wants heightened pleasure and she really wants to enjoy her days. So this energy is very captivating and it captures the attention of both men and women. And although she is more in touch with her sexuality, that doesn't mean that she necessarily acts on it, but it does mean that she's got a fire going in there, you know, it's burning. And this can be a bit uncomfortable for the lover woman sometimes because, you know, on one end society says, that sexuality and sex appeal is everything, but on the other end says that embracing your sexuality and being in tune with your sexuality is not okay. So the lover can sometimes struggle with this balance of like, how do I express myself? Marilyn Monroe was a typical lover and she definitely embodies some of that maiden energy too though, for sure. But Marilyn Monroe was slow and sensual and present in everything she did. You know, she was very expressive with her face. She was captivating and magnetic and even just like by the way she walked, she was a lover. Jessica Rabbit is a lover, you know, that sultry voice, her outfit, the way that she carries herself and holds herself and she just radiates sexual energy. Sofia Vergara gives off a lot of that lover energy. You know, she's passionate, can be a little bit feisty. She's beautiful and she kind of knows her power and knows how powerful her beauty is. She's very expressive too. Samantha from Sex and the City, another great example of a lover. You know, she's very in tune with her sexuality and that's a very important part of her life. Now, some of the potential issues that a lover can have is that they might focus too much on pleasure and living in the moment and what feels good. And although sometimes that can be a great thing if that's what we do all the time then that can lead us to make some really poor choices you know this is the type of woman who might spend way too much money on something because in that moment they want it even though it means their bank account will be totally drained and totally empty before the end of the month they don't necessarily think about the consequences of their actions and they will likely learn some painful lessons in life and learn from some uncomfortable situations that they have accidentally created. But it's important that the lover actually learns from them and uses these lessons going forward. The lover might also struggle with long-term relationships because to them, passion is everything. You know, it's the most important thing in their life. And in long-term relationships, what can sometimes happen is that that passion can ebb and flow. You know, it depends on what you have going on in your life or you're, you're really stressed or whatnot. But this is very hard for the lover woman because she always wants that magic. So if she feels like she's not feeling that anymore, that might cause her to suddenly break up with her partner and move on to someone new, create that new magic, that new spark, that new passion. And then this cycle can happen over and over again. So for the lover, if you want a successful long-term relationship, you have to make sure that that passion stays alive and you have to work to keep that passion going and not let it fade away. If you want to embody more of this lover archetype, slow down, be more present, be more sensual with everything you do. You know, swing your hips when you walk, wear red lipstick, eat a delicious meal slowly and savor every bite and just feel that love and passion within you. You know, that love and passion is in there in every single woman for some women, it might come more naturally than others, but it's in there. Get more comfortable with your sexuality. Don't shy away from attention. Let yourself live a little bit and embrace pleasure. Now, obviously there is a balance to this in life, 
but not 100% everything in your life has to be practical. Life is meant to be experienced and fully enjoyed. All right, let's move on to the queen, and she is embodied by the goddess Hera. So the queen is incredibly loyal and committed. She just naturally has that regal, elegant energy, and she can be a really good leader. But one of the defining aspects of the queen is that marriage and having a partnership is very important to her. You know, she wants to have her king. She wants to love someone and be the backbone of her partner and that is very fulfilling to her. These women are naturally very confident and are very good at taking charge when they need to. And in a relationship, they tend to look for a partner who, you know, is powerful and has high status and is a leader and kind of embodies that king energy. And like I said, the queen women, they're very, very loyal and they expect that same loyalty in return. So in a partnership, they desire a high amount of loyalty. Now, because marriage and a loyal companion is so important to her, sometimes that means that she doesn't feel as fulfilled in her single years. A wonderful example of this queen energy is Blair Waldorf from Gossip Girl, of course. You know, she just radiates queen energy. She knows how to take charge. She is confident. All of that comes naturally to her. Also, Emily from Gilmore Girls, you know, Rory's grandma, she is very fulfilled as a wife. She takes her role as wife very seriously and is very loyal to uh, Richard, her partner. Fine. Let me do that. And she is just naturally very regal and elegant. Hey, Gilmore, you are one classy broad. Also, Nancy Reagan, Ronald Reagan's wife, she was a queen as well. Now, the potential shadow sides of the queen we can see in some of these examples as well. And again, these are just potential weaknesses, but sometimes the queen can be a little bit judgmental, especially of other women. And they can also be a little bit jealous sometimes too. And we can see both of these traits in both Blair and Emily. She can also be the type of woman where like, if you cross her, like you are gonna get it. Revenge. And like I said many times, she is very loyal, which is a great quality of hers. But sometimes she can be loyal almost to a fault. Like she can keep her loyalty to someone or for her husband, for example, even when they don't deserve it anymore, even when she should let it go. The example for this would be, you know, if a husband cheats, the queen woman might get angry at the mistress as opposed to the husband. Sometimes she may struggle with long-term female friends too. You know, female friends might not be as important to her as they are for other women. That doesn't mean that they're not important, but oftentimes they're just not as important. You know, she may be the type of woman, especially if she's younger, like in high school or college, where she gets a boyfriend and then she immediately drops all of her friends and stops hanging out with them. That is one of the potential weaknesses of the queen. So if you are a queen, don't forget forget about your girlfriends because they are very important. These women might also struggle with low self-esteem if they're not in a relationship because it is usually so important to them. And a little tip, if you are in a relationship, be sure to not lose your sense of self. Make sure that you're still doing things just for you and you know who you are as your own individual woman. So if you want to embody some of this queen energy though, practice your confidence. You know, don't be afraid to take charge when it feels right or even when it feels uncomfortable too. Keep your chin up, even dress more more regal and elegant, all of these things will help. And let yourself be committed and loyal to the people in your life that love you and that deserve it. And see the beauty in that deep loyalty. Now let's move on to the Huntress. And she is very different from what we've talked about so far. So the Huntress is embodied by the goddess Artemis. And she is bold, courageous, independent, adventurous, and very goal-oriented. She's a woman who has little interest in pleasing other people just for the sake of it. You know, she's not a people pleaser. And she knows what she wants in life. And sometimes she can come off as a bit stubborn, but she's usually not very stubborn. She's usually just very determined and focused and knows what she wants. Huntress women are usually very passionate about the causes that are important to her and have a deep desire to make an impact in the world and fulfill their purpose. And although they may definitely still want marriage and children and all of that, it's usually not like the highest priority in their life. Or if they do want that, it's something that might come later in their life. A lot of Huntress women feel like they want to live their life first. The Hunters can also be very competitive and focused and resilient. You know, think about Katniss Everdeen from Hunger Games. She is a huntress. She is bold. She is adventurous and she is focused. I volunteer! I volunteer! 
Also Kate from the newer season of Bridgerton, she is a huntress, you know, she is out riding her horse alone in the middle of the night. Now as the season progresses, you can see that Anthony kind of brings out the inner lover in her. You could see that through their chemistry and their passion and that spark and them making some, you know, maybe some bad decisions. But at the end of the day, she still very much has this strong, independent huntress energy. Wonder Woman is another example. Uh, Miranda from Sex in the City, you know, she was very goal focused. And for the huntress, her goals are usually like her highest priority in life. Gloria Steinem is another great example of the huntress. She was a very big leader in the femininity movement and had a strong passion and purpose and focus in her life. And that's another quality about the huntress. They usually are very big or outspoken or passionate about women's rights or being an ally to women. So some potential shadow sides though is that sometimes she can be a little bit emotionally distant or aloof or she might be a little bit oblivious to the emotions and feelings of others. Uh, not very empathetic. You know, she might come off as cold sometimes. They can also be prone to anger as well. You know, sometimes the hunter's woman really struggles in the area of like love, compassion, forgiveness, letting go and surrendering. If they're a less evolved woman, they may also see any sort of stereotypical feminine traits like love, softness, gentleness, receptivity as less than or weak. So an unevolved huntress woman might look down on that, even though at the same time they're trying to champion women's causes. Now, if you want to embody more of the huntress, focus on your goals. Focus on your passion and purpose in your life. Stay focused. Don't be afraid to be bold and do things on your own sometimes. You know, be a bit more independent. Speak up, use your voice, get behind some sort of cause or movement. Even participating in more sports can help you to embody more of that huntress energy. Next is the sage and she's portrayed by the goddess Athena. So the sage is wise, loves to learn and is usually a quick learner at that. She's organized, strategic, and she's usually very mature. Like even from a young age, she acts very mature, she's resourceful, she's practical, and in general, she tends to be ruled more by her head than by her heart. And she takes logic and practicality quite seriously. But she is the type of woman who gets stuff done. You know, she's efficient, she is smart, and she doesn't crumble under pressure. She is able to keep her cool and, you know, handle the situation. She's curious, she's good at investigating and researching, she's a good planner, she's also patient. But the most important aspect of the stage is that she is driven by the pursuit of knowledge and has a natural wisdom and intellect within her. And even though she has all those logical, practical, organized qualities, that doesn't mean she can't also be creative. And she may also love to teach as well. And similar to the Huntress, the Sage Woman is also more independent too. And her main top priority in life is usually not love and a partner. It's usually has to do with knowledge and her own development. Amal Clooney is a Sage, super wise, very educated, educated, grounded, elegant, respected, successful. Um, Hermione from Harry Potter, she was a sage. Um, she always had her head in a book. She was always learning something new. She was the smartest one in her class. Even Emma Watson herself gives off strong sage energy. You know, education was important to her. She went to an Ivy League school. She was a UN ambassador. Olivia Pope from Scandal is a sage. A lot of presidents' wives are sages actually, like Michelle Obama, she has strong sage energy. And the reason for this is that sages also make really great counselors and strategizers. And they usually play a very important role, not only in the success of themselves, but also the success of their husbands. You know that saying like, behind every man is a great woman? That's especially true with the sage woman. She helps him to strategize and succeed. And the sage woman is also very attracted to hardworking, highly respected men in leadership positions. Now the potential shadow side of the sage though is that sometimes she can be a little bit too disconnected from her emotions and her body and her intuition. And it might be hard to connect with those deeper emotional parts of herself and really tap into like any sort of passion and intimacy within her. It's just something that the stage woman has to consciously think about. You know, she has to consciously think to not get too stuck in her head and also be able to tap into her heart and the deeper parts of herself. The stage woman also has the potential to be a little bit critical sometimes and possibly even a little bit intimidating because, you know, stage is they know their stuff. They're very knowledgeable in their field and they can sometimes come off as a little bit harsh or even a little bit cold sometimes if they lack empathy, understanding, and love. Now, if you want to embody more of that sage energy though, 
learn. Focus on your intellectual pursuits. Focus on expanding your knowledge. Let your interests guide you to books and courses and podcasts, etc. Become wise and knowledgeable in your field. The biggest thing that you can do to tap into your sage energy is to expand your knowledge and learn new things and become so confident in what you know that you just give off this like grounded, confident, wise energy. But you can also try to be more organized, having a more organized household or a more organized organized way of life, this will really help you as well. Last is the mystic, and she is embodied by the goddess Hestia. So the mystic is intuitive, usually very introverted, and her biggest focus in life is her own inner peace and her own inner tranquility. And she is likely more spiritually minded or religious, but she doesn't have a big ego at all. Like she does not focus on achievements or success just for the sake of status or anything like that. That is just not important to her. She is a homebody and really loves her home and really tries to take care of it because again, her main focus is inner peace and tranquility and her home is an extension of that. Another quality about the mystic though is that they naturally feel very warm and cozy. They give off the energy of like a comforting fire. That's how people feel when they're with a mystic woman, like they're sitting next to a cozy fire. In general, the mystic is very inward focused and is usually very creative. And it's possible that she is an artist or a writer or a photographer or something of that nature. And the competitive corporate world is not for her. Like the mystics and hustle culture just do not mix. She needs independence to create in her own way and at her own pace. Mystics are often not portrayed in the media and they're a lot harder to find examples for, but the best one that I've heard is that singer Sade, you know, she just gives off this warm energy, very intuitive. Like she looks intuitive. She sounds intuitive. She seems very inward focused and soulful. And Phoebe from Friends, she's a little bit different, you know, a little bit more extroverted, but she still has a lot of these mystic qualities. You know, she kind of doesn't really care what people think. She marches to the beat of her own drum. She's a little bit quirky, but also kind of like wise and intuitive at the same time. Also, I feel like Angelina Jolie embodies a lot of these mystic qualities as well. You know, she seems very introverted. Apparently she's very into astrology. I feel like she's very into all of that kind of stuff. I don't know, she just comes off as having those mystic qualities. And same with Megan Fox. Like I feel like she's got some mystic in her as well. But the potential shadow sides of the mystic is that they might coop themselves up too much. You know, they love their alone time, but they might accidentally completely isolate themselves or be too much of a homebody. They might forget how important it is to have community and to be with friends and family. So if you're a mystic, it's okay to love your alone time, but don't forget to balance it out with time with others. The mystic can also sometimes lack the ability to be like assertive and stand up for themselves and be bold when they need to. And because they're naturally more inward, they tend to struggle with expressing their emotions outwardly and communicating their feelings and their needs and all of those things like that. And they have this tendency to naturally pull everything inward and isolate themselves when they're struggling or when they have heavier emotions, but we all need support sometimes. Sometimes the mystic needs to learn how to communicate and ask for help and reach out for support and love. Now, if you want to embody more of the mystic, meditate, pray, spend time alone, but quality time alone, not just like sitting on your bed, scrolling on your phone, take a bubble bath or read a book and journal or something like that. Any sort of solo activities that put you in a zen-like state or a flow-like state can be really beneficial for embodying the mystic. So painting, drawing, cooking, or photography, or anything artsy or creative that can really help here. The mystic is also a little bit slower and more present in their life. So try to slow down a bit and kind of forget about time sometimes and just be in the moment. And of course, listen to your intuition. Try to hear your intuition. Intuition. Try to tap more into that side of yourself. This will really help you to tap into that inner mystic. Let me know in the comments which archetype or archetypes you resonate with most or what your quiz results were. Um, I'll share mine in the comments as well, but I think it'd be fun if we all just kind of shared. So just remember though, that all of these feminine archetypes, it's not about just, you know, finding who you are. It's about learning to access the different parts of yourself. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time. Bye.